welcome to Josie. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and um, I run Josie with Ben and Brett. Um, before introducing tonight's guest, um, we need to just do some so-called um, housekeeping. Um, we've provided masks. There's masks down here. Um, there's also some hand gel. Um, unless you're exempt from wearing masks, then we would just encourage you to do so. Um, we're going to leave the door ajar, and there's some windows open through there, so we'll, we'll try and create some sort of through breeze. Um, ben, unfortunately, has um, tested positive for COVID, um, but he's here in a disembodied form uh, in that laptop. <laughs> so we can maybe wave to Ben, uh, who's elsewhere, just, just up the road. Uh, it's a tremendous privilege um, to welcome um, Terry and Tim this evening, and, and all of you, for this In Conversation event. Uh, between our exhibiting artist Terry Atkinson and the art historian TJ Clark. Um, hopefully you've had an opportunity to see the exhibition uh, up the road at uh, Willow Lane and also here at Ten Bell Lane. Uh, up the road we're exhibiting the American Civil War Works, a selection from 2018 ongoing, uh, as, as well as a Greaser sculpture and here you can see um, the complete Berlin uh, East Prussia and the Desert Works from 2014 to 17. This is the first time they've been shown in their entirety. It's a great privilege to be able to, to do it, this at Josie uh, and another Greaser sculpture. Um, during the process of organising the exhibition, um, Terry shared correspondences with various people, including uh, people like Noam Chomsky, um, the art historian Mark Metzauer, uh, and also TJ Clark. Um, and when we learned that uh, Tim lived part of the time in Norfolk with Anne Wagner, uh, it seemed to be a kind of um, perfect fit. Uh, not just because of the correspondence, um, but also the depth of their history. So um, it was uh, Tim who appointed um, Terry on the same day as Fred Orton and Griselda Pollock. <coughs> Um, to work on the fine art program at the um, University of Leeds in 1977. And when Tim visited us a few weeks ago, he said that he'd hired um, Terry to, quote, throw a hand grenade into this old-fashioned art course. So there's a, there's a depth of history. And one of these letters um, that Terry uh, shared with us, and I, I call it a letter, but it was a 17,000-word uh, deep oh, that many, was it? <laughs> Got, got out of hand. <laughs> respond, <laughs> responds to um, Clark's 2018, Tim's 2018 book, Heaven on Earth. Um, and I just wanted to read just a few of the first lines uh, from that letter. Um, Dear Tim, as per usual, your book presses in on my practice. The combing out and diffuse layers I take from the book that affect and feed into my ongoing views of practice is probably derived from my own eccentricities, not least those accumulated and gathered up over the 60 years of my practice, as much as resulting from anything and all you wrote in the book. It is a very good, powerful, and apposite book. Um, we are joined this evening by the Book Hive, Norwich's premier independent bookstore, who is selling um, titles of uh, <laughs> Tim's. Um, but also, uh, we have produced a publication, um, which I just read from, which is um, Tim uh, Terry's uh, text on Heaven on Earth. It also includes reproductions from the American Civil War series selection, which is on display up the road. Um, you can pre-order a, a copy of this if you're interested. It's in the corner. There's a sheet that you can fill out. Um, I've got some biographical details I could share. Shall I do the biographical details, or do you just... <laughs> Okay, so um, Terry Atkinson was born in the village of Fernsco, Yorkshire, in 1939. Uh, he's the co-founder of two of the most influential artist collectives in post-war contemporary art, Fine Arts, with John Boasted, Ro Roger Jeffs and Bernard Jennings. Uh, that was uh, co-founded in 63. And Art and Language with David Bainbridge, Michael Baldwin and Harold Harrell in 1968. Atkinson's work, both as a, as a member of fine arts and art and language, and, and also individually, is widely known and critically acclaimed internationally. His works have been exhibited extensively in Great Britain, Europe, Canada, and the USA at various venues, so venues such as the Whitechapel uh, in London, Kunstwerk Institute for Contemporary Art uh, in Berlin, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Documenta uh, Castle, 
Venice Biennale and the Irish Museum of Modern Art Dublin. Um, in 85, Terry was nominated for the Turner Prize. Um, more recent, in either solo or group format, um, international exhibitions have occurred at MoMA Vienna in 2013, um, Yale Union up in Portland, Oregon in 2014, which was um, curated with Richard Burkett, who lent some of the works that are here tonight, which is very generous of him, uh, ICA San Francisco 2018 and Galleria 6 Milan 2019. Terry lives in Leamington Spa, England, with his wife, uh, the artist Sue Atkinson, who is, who is with us this evening, um, with whom he's frequently collaborated. TJ Clark uh, taught art history at UC Berkeley for many years, and uh, his publications include, for example, Image of the People, Gustave Courbet and the 1848 Revolution, uh, The Painting of Modern Life, Paris and the Art of Manet and His Followers, uh, Farewell to an Idea, episodes in the history of modernism, Sight of Death, and uh, most recently Heaven on Earth, um, Painting in the Life to Come. Some of you will obviously be readers of Tim's engrossing essays and poetry published in the London Review of Books, uh, and his new book, uh, which is titled If These Apples Should Fall, Suzanne and the Present will be out this summer. Uh, Terry and Tim will talk for about an hour uh, or so, um, but we'll also open up um, to the floor for questions. Um, so thank you very much, over to you. Okay. Well, I thought I'd uh, begin. I'd just sort of ask... I assumed ask, you'd uh, begin. ...ask you some mm -hmm. questions mm -hmm. um, and listen, you know, get a 13-page answer. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, what I think it would be great is that if we started sooner or later and sooner to talk about, you know, to talk in some kind of way that's directed to the stuff that's all around us. But uh, inevitably it's going to, you know, wander off into more uh, general topics and maybe even wander a, off a little bit into reminiscence, but I hope not too much. Uh, but I'll, I'll start with one bit of reminiscence, which is, you know, we really, although we'd met once or twice before, it was in Leeds, um, in the kind of uh, art history, fine art program that we uh, became friends and worked together. Um, and uh, yes, it was true that uh, appointing Terry was certainly a way of kind of making trouble, um, you know, in the studios. Uh, you know, it was the 70s, it was very close to the, it was, it was a turbulent time, it was an uphe a time of upheaval. It was a time when, you know, many, many uh, practices and categories were um, in the melting pot, really, and among them art. Um, and uh, I certainly knew that bringing Terry to talk and teach um, in the studios was was going to you know it's going to stretch things it was i mean we we wanted uh to see if we could uh teach and study art in a way which put uh almost all assumptions about what art was and what teaching it might be under under pressure I mean, I remember we talked together in the studios mm. very early Quite on, yeah. almost from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And Quite I, a few times. Yeah, and I think that we taught a first year, <laughs> uh, a first year painting um, class in the studio, probably in term two, um, and it was uh, it was I think about. Uh, 20 paragraphs from Wittgenstein. Mm. I think it was the private language, yeah, it was. wasn't it? Yeah, it was the private language. The private language. And, uh, you, you know, you can imagine the uh, face, the expression on the faces of some of these, some of the, you know, some of the young people who were faced with this, right? You know, well, what are you going to do with um, Wittgenstein on private language? What are you going to make of it? What do you, what are you, you know, with the, with the emphasis on make, really... Mm. Um, and actually, some of them made made very good yeah, it good was stuff out of it. Surprising, yeah. Mm. So that's I mean that, if you like, is the background. I mean we haven't we've met very seldom, 
through the decades since, but we've kept in touch uh, and, uh, you know, uh, lately have been writing to and fro quite a bit. Um, Terry, you may want to send, say a few things by way of preface, but he, my first question really is immediately sort of posed to the what's on the walls mm -hmm. around us. Um, and it's a question about how you, how you chose these images, how you chose this subject. Um, it, it seems as though what you're doing is a kind of history painting. Uh, your subject here, you know, relentlessly is the Second World War, uh, particularly the Second World War in the East mm. and Berlin. Mm. Um, I think it would be really helpful if, I suppose you sort of answered this on two levels. You know, how did you come to this? And what's your notion of, you know, what you're, you're doing here? Um, do you see yourself as a history painter or a history drawer? Whatever, yeah. 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 Um, Speaking of reminiscence, I mean, I can remember the last three or four years of the war. Um, yeah. I can remember that reading headlines, when was that August 1945, when they dropped the two bombs. So the war had an impact, and also it was, it was something that um, cooked up the Cold War. I mean, the Cold War was there long before the World War Two, in in kind of shroud form. But after yeah. w after World War Two, the pressure was there, and it, it created up the Stalinist reflex versus uh, the McCarthyite. Get them out of Hollywood. All that, I think, was fed into this. But also, the relationship between the two wars. Because um, my parents' generation, they were born early in the century, 1906, 1908. Their generation talked about World War II a lot in relation to World War I. Yeah. So this was kind of, um, I guess, uh, child law. Yeah. And um, it was also very spaced out, the, my view of the First World War. I didn't realise until I got into my teenage that I had quite an unusual war because my father was there throughout the war because he was a yeah. protected occupation. Mm -hmm. Those mining villages were full of men. Very untypical of World War II. Sue's father, for example, was in the last three years, two or three years of the war, much more typical, you know. Uh, not in a protected occupation, so it, it, there was a lot. Of, there is a lot of domestic stuff here mm. in, in in these images. I know they don't appear to be domestic, but they are reminiscent in one sense. But I think the main cooking oil of the of the operation was the Cold War itself that that dominated our generation, yeah. yours and my generation, and it was. Um, it was fought by proxy, and m my entire art school career from 58 to 64 was constantly being used one way or the other um, in the West versus East operation. Then there was the counterweight to that was the fact that the British made made it sound, at least, as if the British, with the help of the Americans, won the war. Um, so by the time I was 16 or 17, I was beginning to realize that it was the Russians that destroyed the Wehrmacht, yeah. not the Americans and, or the Brits. That destroyed the actual germ the army. And, I mean, the, ca the, the casualty figures of, of um, how many Germans died is astronomical in the East, and, and then it makes the, the stuff in the West look. And then there's the, the, the projection forward 
that I can remember first thinking about this when I was probably in my mid-twenties. Did the Americans, assuming that it would have gone on till August, the war in Europe, did the Americans have a series of German cities listed out, ready to drop the bomb? So that, that brought in a, a whole other the thought of Dusseldorf or, or in, in my case, um, Cologne b being bombed out like Nagasaki or Hiroshima. But that, that brought it home because uh, with art and language particularly, we were in sit those cities in Europe all the time. So the, the, the practice became compacted in a way and these, I think, come out of that kind of series of operations. Yes. yes. That's great. I mean, that really helps a lot to sort of, you know, understand the drive or what led you back to the subject. So, but there's a big leap between that and selecting out, mm. right, what's, what's all around us. Uh, what's, your, what's the process here? How do you, what, what are you looking at? And, what do you, what, and are you able to say what you're looking for? Well, obviously the, the juxtapositions are that um, I think that that's probably more personal still. The, the juxtapositions are the fact that um, the, the first the World War Two had a, a big impact on me because it, it kind of froze a certain aspect of my childhood, I think. But when you think that um, the impact of, say, rock and roll, um, rock and roll had the biggest impact on me, say Chuck Berry or, or whoever, Buddy Holly or whoever, um, and on my generation. But for me personally, it also came at the time when Gagarin was going around the globe and the yeah. Russians were high tech. Yeah. Um, so uh, those sorts of things made me think. We need. To, I need to. I need to think about what they're projecting forward to the, these drawings. I mean, some of them are straight, like the first one there. That's just the surrender. Yeah. But by the time you get to the f fourth one, are these in order? By the way, I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. They are in order. By the time we get to the fourth one, I'm already bringing in. Celluloid, celluloid heroes, if you like, yeah. um, and that belongs to two generations down from me. That's yeah. that's my grandkids' generation. So I was thinking of the historical junctures. That that, that certainly was a um, a big way of um, how the choices were made, or literally how they were made. Put them together, try them out, yeah. um, and I think. Hollywood probably, well, perhaps for all of us, but certainly for me, that's been a, a huge, I wouldn't say influence, but a, a huge input. Yeah. And there, the, the difference between input and influence with these drawings, I think, is, is um, tricky. Yeah. Um, that's what, how I came up with the, time, the notion of the time travel. Right. And it was also the impact of that, you know, what you call that, that terrible conspectus of Mark Mazower's The Dark Continent. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember reading that. Which is a, a sort of history of the 20th century. Europe, uh, what's it called? Dark Continent. Dark yeah, Continent. Dark Continent. Yeah. Europe's 20th century. It was a very fine history of the 20th century, but, you know. And uh, spooky. Relentless in yeah. its depiction of the horror, really, of Europe. In the, yeah. And I, it, what it brought on to me is what it is to be a modern European. What, what, what a lineage we are, you know. I mean, yeah. it, 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 we carved up the world yeah. and then we, we, t we then turned to thinking, blaming the world we carved up for our, for our darkness. Yeah. Um, and I think Mazar brought that. Up. He was quite a big influence on on how this was put together. Yeah. 
But then there's the other side, which is perhaps the trickiest bit of the lot. Uh, would my generation have grown up with Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly if it wasn't for the Red Army? Yeah. 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 So, 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 it, 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 you're, it, it, I guess it is a kind of poised position, but it's also a kind of poisoned position as well. Yeah. 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 Does that help? Yeah, it does <laughs> help. It does help. I mean, uh, I'm not quite sure I get the rock and roll dimension to this yet, <laughs> you know, but and maybe we can press you on that. But I, what I'm certainly making more sense of, and it, uh, it makes more sense of, of an ET arriving or, you know, what, the, what you call, it's an interesting year, word you use for these figures, uh, Goya-esque, mm. Goya-esques, um, uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally, a, well, just once a Picasso Minotaur. Um, I, I, what, what I think you've said sort of helps me realize that one of the one of the proposals of the series is, you know, well, look again at what our modernity was made out of. Mm. How mm. could it? How could we possibly have almost? You know, how could we possibly have survived <laughs> this? Right? You know, how could normality have? I'm not sure we have. Emerged. No, well, exactly, yes. Yes, I mean, that's probably part of it, isn't yeah. it? That the Goya-esques uh, are really not contemporaries of this, this past, they're, or they're sort of partly visiting this past, but they're, they're still here. Yeah, well, the, the, I think the art feed is always strong. The feed directly from art sources is, is, is always strong. But... Peculiar for, for, perhaps for some people, but these are not what I call my best career works. They're practice rather than career. And I draw a distinction between, you know, I mean, I'd say Damien Hirst is a career artist. Yeah. And the practice follows the career. Uh, these were made without any real estate being involved at all. They were made set, sitting next to Sue watching television. And they were all in a sketchbook. Yeah. So it was lightweight technology, pen, mostly pencil, uh, as opposed to grease, for example. It was small scale. It was extremely enjoyable in the sense that with that kind of lightweight technology, you, you become very mobile. Yeah. So you could flit from figure to figure. I'm sure that was one reason I was able to to place alongside, without undue embarrassment, E.T., Bart Simpson, or whatever. And that runs, that's the common theme into the American Civil War work. Yeah. Um, and I think those, those kind of motifs, from Goya to Spielberg, Spielberg figures, et cetera, that those seem to me to sit without any real discomfort, um, I better qualify that. They sit together without any discomfort, but they're, they're part of the discomfort of, yes. of Mazar, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these things are, are, are um, they were dead easy in one sense. Um, you know, they were, they were, it wasn't hard to do them. They, they, everything was, Everything was light. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there is a distinction, isn't there, Terry, between the E.T. Um, I mean, OK, I'm going to try and put it into words, what I see happening there. Um, I mean, actually, in some kind of way, E.T. is you. Mm. You know, I mean, it's this kind of you, know, the, the, the kind of absolutely mind-boggled time traveller, right? Sort of, you know, finding himself trapped in this, in this past, which is his past, his history, or, you know, what we're supposed to 
think, you know, uh, we're part of Europe or whatever. Um, and how can it possibly be that when you get back there, this is what it was, right? You yeah. know, so, uh, and there were once or twice when, yeah, this extraordinary image far right on the middle row there, which is was used for the, um, for the, card wasn't it for the invite oh, yeah, the ET yeah, one, the ET one. Mm. I mean ET looks like a sort of swaddled baby right I mean mm. it's, you know he's a, actually a baby coming into the world and saying what you know about a baby with full consciousness maybe full historical consciousness and so I say how can I how can this be that this is where I am and that, that is part of you isn't it I mean that you can't well that, that one's the, the, the swaddling bit is there's a fire behind, and I think the title mentions, doesn't it, that it, could, a, be, it could be Goebbels. Yeah, Bernie, Now, Magda Bernie. Goebbels poisoned eight kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, killed eight kids. So those, those. You mean as part of the suicide pact? Uh, the suicide, suicide pact, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, so the references are, uh, in many ways, quite obscure. Uh, they have to take. It takes. Um, you know, an art historian of some standing, apparently, to dig them out. And, um, but that's, that was, funnily enough, that was one of the, motive, the motives for making that drawing. Yeah. That um, you turn E.T., you remember E.T., e e this unbelievably sentimental relationship he has with the boy. And uh, somehow I'd managed to, to think however you do, everybody does it, I guess, in a, some bizarre moment, that um, how does somebody poison eight kids, your own kids? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're looking at your own kids, your own grandkids, and um, you're thinking, well, that must be World War II. But that's what happens in... Yeah. So we, it's Mazar again, you know. Yeah. This, this is what it is to be a modern European. Um, yeah. the, the, the book, I think, that kind of came at the end it was Olasoga's book about, uh, about about what it what the British Empire really meant you know yeah yeah and there's there's, there's a British em strong British Empire references Keith Douglas there uh, on the top row yeah stood in front. next to the uh, yeah. next to the end so, so the, the yeah. cultural references are quite wide and yeah. I think in in many ways but most of all it was the pace of it, because the technology was light, because I didn't have any real estate, no studio. Yeah. These are not studio produced in any grand sense. And so you look at these people um, in the um, in the colour supplements or even more on yeah, TV. What are you looking at, though, Terry? What's the range of materials? Because, you know, some of these images are familiar, one or two. Um, but many are not at all familiar, right? You know, where where did you find them? Well, there's a, a lot of research went into them. Yeah. I mean, this um, is it. This one. These these German still lives. Um, there's one. I can't remember. There's one of these which they used a drug to keep. When the Germans were really under fire, particularly after the Americans came in, um, into World War II, I mean, when the Germans were really under fire, they kept them awake, unnaturally, with, with the, this drug. I, I, I've drawn it somewhere. No, it's not, it's not that one. It's, is it that one up at the top? I'm going to up the, no, it's not. This is Russian stuff. Yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is food for the Red Army made in Illinois. Um, yeah. Because, the, you know, it, Stalin actually openly admitted at the end of the war that the Red Army's mobility rested almost entirely on, on American can-do. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, anyway... The, these kind of motifs I dug out by researching. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't have to research Goya. That, that, that's <coughs> thirty years deep. You yes. know that stuff. Yes. But some of these figures had, had to be pulled out. 
I didn't know that Frank Phillips, which is the one on the top right, top left, BBC, yeah. he yeah. was a bit, I remember Frank Phillips, I remember listening to his broadcasts at the end of the war, yeah. and he was, I think, number four on Goebbels' hit list. That, that when, when the invasion, when they got into Britain, they, they wrote out the They'd root out these guys who girls had done a, a neat list. Well, yeah. that, that's the sort of thing I was digging out. Yes, yes. Um, you know, be, before... <coughs> what time is it? OK, before... <laughs> well, we've been, we've been on half an hour. Um, <laughs> give us a few more minutes and then we'll open up, you know. Yeah. And, uh, the sooner the better. Yeah. Um, uh, you, but I'm not going to let you off the hook. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Um, it, <laughs> It's very interesting because, uh, you know, Terry is an extremely articulate character, as you know, and he is uh, a character who has a tremendous impatience with those who say, you know, that uh, visual art um, has its own language. <laughs> Um, and that, uh, and you know, look, there's a long history to this. Uh, people of our age have really can remember, you know, at Campbell School of Art or the wherever, school, you, know, wherever. Yeah. you know, but there really were the the teaching orthodoxy was, you know, don't don't talk painter paint, yeah, right. Um, and of course, art and language was all about, you know, that is a complete. You're fooling yourself that you don't talk and you know, just talk badly, that's all, <laughs> and your bad talk makes you paint badly. So, you know, it's, it, there's, uh, that polemic was central. Um, and it still goes on, and we argue about this. You know, we argue about the and in art and language, yeah. right? Yeah. What is the nature of that and? So here's my question, you know, loaded in the usual way. Let's look at that one. Lovely one, I think. The one, two, three from the from the right uh, in the middle row. Yeah. The 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 two young guys with the cartridge cartridges. Yeah, yeah. with the guy the, guy and, around. And the figure. Yeah. So, w what have you got to say, Terry, about the the, the uh, how did Goya appear? Why did Goya appear? Do you, I mean, when something like that happens, what kind of... How do you register that choice? Or do you... You, you must... You're a Chomskyan, so you, you, you think that you're internally talking about it. Yeah, all the time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not... Such, it, we won't get into that, though. That, <laughs> we, we'll be here all night. Yeah. Um, the Goya thing... Those are two... Soviet Marines, the, the, the guys, they're, they're, they're the Navy guys who fought with the Army. Yeah. Um, like the Americans had an Army Air Force, the Soviets had a kind of Navy Army. Yeah. Um, so that in itself was interesting because the, the, Brit, the British military operation is really quite rigid. The Army is the Army, the Navy is the Navy, and the Air Force is the Air Force. But Goya, I think, comes along because it's it's simple. It's the disasters of war. And, you know, if, if we're talking about um, war being a disaster, then World War II, it, it, it runs strongly. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, the mess we've made in Iraq, yeah. Afghanistan, etc., is... It, it, is any better? We're, we're still yeah. deep in the shit, and I think Goy is very good at, uh, or, or at least the images seem to me to be very useful for dealing with shit. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. and, okay. Uh, this Goya esque, right? Who appears more than once, doesn't yeah. he? He's over, he's over here somewhere. Yeah. Um, Typical Goya in that, and I think you've actually, in, in drawing it, you've adapted it and made it even more so, which is that it's horror, but it's also 
absurdity. Yeah. So what's that about? Why? Why? why yeah. Okay. Well, what's it about? I mean, yeah, if we're talking about absurdity, um, you know, all the all the old left Labour seats where I'm from up in the north. You've heard of the red. You've heard of the red wall. It's, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, well, the red there's wall. an absurdity, for example. You know, yeah. from Arthur from Arthur Scargill to Boris Johnson in what two decades? Yeah, yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. Um, I remember you saying, by the way, at the time of uh, the miners' strike, that the the miners cannot lose. Yeah. You remember? Well, we the, the, seen as we brought Leeds up. You know, we were um, we were only in Leeds. We only lived in Leeds in seventy seven to seventy eight, and we just got back to Leamington when Thatcher got in, and the welfare state disappeared almost overnight. You know. yeah. We became what she kept endlessly on about a property owning democracy, yeah. which is what we are. I yeah. mean, some of us own two or three properties. <laughs> And some are zone none. <laughs> it, that's the problem yeah. with democracy, yeah. and th that strikes me as totally absurd. I mean, we've now got the height of absurdity with the lot we've got in at the moment. They are something else. I'm, I'm looking back. I can remember every government since Attlee, and I never, re I never remember one quite as as absurd as this one. Yeah. It is truly absurd in my view. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the reflection of the nation. The nation's absurd. And uh, so why can't I be absurd? Yeah, okay. okay. That's great. Uh, yeah. Um, I have got some more questions, but I'm going to stop. Um, and uh, I ask people if, you know, ask people to ask questions. Yeah, I've got a really um, naive question because it's the first time I've seen these works, so I apologise for the naivety of it. Uh, but kind of my kind of very kind of first impression about kind of looking around, I was kind of making mental links back to um, Bartok Brett's uh, war crime from the 1950s. In a way, that also tried to historicise and think about um, the kind of World War Two, but and doing so through a sort of juxtaposition. Um, so it's kind of and then it's often a kind of a use of kind of Hollywood kind of, sort of stereotypes died and the cowboy being the faster shooter than the German or the Japanese soldier. Um, so I was kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about if it, how you might position this body of work in relation to like the Isney position to like, um, so I suppose it's kind of a question that I suppose of kind of how direct you and kind of is this. Mm. Say again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of really about. Um, kind of Can you like, take your mask off to ask yeah, the question? Yeah. I, think, I think that's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so um, War Crime by kind of Bartol Brecht from the 1950s. Mm, uh, right, right. And a kind of sort of juxtaposition of kind of photographs and text as a way of sort of trying to come to terms with um, the visual representation of World War II and how that gets replayed in. Uh, U.S. and kind of German media, um, so it's kind of sort of seen kind of this work as a kind of first impression as a, a kind of a restage or you know, kind of a like an update and a kind of war crime, but maybe from a position of sort of time out of joint. So yeah, yeah, yeah kind of I, during, I, mm. and kind of here we are, sort of sixty years later, and it's quite different so from Adam Bloomberg and Oliver Chinar and yeah, 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 like yeah. war crime too. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, I get it. I get it now. Yeah, so it's kind of under yeah. Talk a little bit about that, I'm just completely well off the beam. Yeah. Talk about peace crimes as well a bit. Um, yeah, well, what can you say really? The, the, what I think about the war crime thing, if I think anything about it, I mean, when you think about Nuremberg or, or wherever, I mean, I can remember Nuremberg, for example. That was, I was seven or eight, and, and it was Pathy News. That's the other side of this. 
these drawings, the, the, the media transmission. Um, I mean, media in the 40s and 50s, when we were growing up, was, is, was expansive and extremely influential, but it was nothing like it is now. I mean, it, it's expansive now to the point of you're, you're overwhelmed by detail almost. You know, it, it, if, if, if Boris Johnson farts, it gets reported. You know, uh, it's that kind of level. Um, so I think that, that there is a sense in which we've become, war crimes have become media events. I'm thinking of Milosevic in, in The Hague. Uh, the first time it was, I think, really brought home to my generation was when the Israelis tried um, Klaus, what's his name? Sign of oh, age. yes, um, Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann. Yeah, Adolf Eichmann. When was that, 62, something like that? Yeah. yeah. But then, then you saw that side of the war. You saw one aspect of the war focused up. Um, these, I think, were uh, trying to make perhaps n not so much general, but a more multiple operation. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I guess I'm anti, I'm anti-American, anti-Russian, anti-British, anti-whatever, um, and in in the end you become kind of bitter. So there is a bitterness, I think, in these drawings. Um, you, you know, it's kind of rancidness, the rancidness of the of the system we're in, and also. It's what happens to you as well. It's not just what happened then. It's the fact that now you've got grandkids. So you're projecting forward more. You're thinking, well, what the fuck is going on for them when, when yeah. you know? It's interesting you say that you think they're rancid. Yeah, they have the rancid moments. But I mean, in some kind of strange way, they're, they're not just full of anti-war, <laughs> finger wagging, right? You know, I mean, uh, again, just moving along that middle line, beyond the, beyond the two young guys with the Goya visitor, yeah. to that guy. That's one of the strongest works, I think, here, actually, the next one. That very, very simple. Which one? The, 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 the guy um, just, just next door. Oh, yeah, like, right. Just holding, holding the big yeah. Bren gun or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, so I, th I think floating around in the, these works, and that's again another thing that E.T. and the Goya visitors do, is, is say, well, what on earth can be the attitude to this, mm. right? This, this profound, it's, it's even beyond madness, right? That's why the word crime won't do. Mm -hmm. You know, what are, what's, not, what's not crime in, in this kind of situation? And so you get, you get a lot of moments here in which people are, people are surviving. Pe mm -hmm. You know, people, people are kind of look, looking at others, at you, at themselves. You know, just where the hell am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of that in it, um, and they're mostly anonymous. I mean, yeah. they're not, they're not, they're not. Um, there aren't many of them that that use. You, when you think there's sixty odd of them, I think there aren't many of them that use Keith Douglas or Picasso. Or, but running through is 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 got it. Goya is running through. Yeah, um, and I think Goya is, as I said. The artist who deals best with the shit. You know, I mean, he really does deal in shit. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the Capricos particularly, or, or it, if we're looking for if we're looking for the various feeds into the work, then then Goya is is probably the main feed in this setup, and the Capricos are the main operations. And I think the Capricos are. The d disasters of war are kind of savage, and, but the Capricos have that kind of uh, absurdity, yeah. and also this kind of cutting, caricature, 
caricature, but heavy caricature. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, popular media caricature with with Goya. It's yeah. let's really get to it, and deal with it. And there's no solution also with Goya. Yeah. Please. Yeah, just um, following on from that. Um, yeah, I was just thinking back, like as you were talking about Goya, and I was thinking to the black paintings and the fact that they are like they're really shitty and it's like it's a kind of disaster. I don't know. I don't know. In to intern hate death. Um, yeah, really dark paintings. I was remembering you were speaking about the sculpture as a kind of art grunt. Yeah. So. I was just wondering, why is it so neat? Like, if you could talk about the well, cleanliness. Well, actually, yes, it's a very good point. Um, <laughs> they're, be they're beautifully made, these ones. Um, I think that's a really good point. And, and they do... Um, these ones, this one particularly, is contained... The, the grease is contained. The only way it's going to come, come out is this way. Um, and it'll depend on the temperature. Um, if, he, if they've got a good heating system in here and, turn it, and they turn it up, it will start running. But it won't expand this way, whereas the, the first greases I used were flat, flat in and they, 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 they expanded horizontally, but they also expanded gravity being what it is, onto somebody's parquet floor who bought a piece of it. I mean, these were kind of collector sensitive in that sense. Um, and, um, you know, there was, um, I had a phone call one sitting, we were sitting in Lamington Spa one comfortable Sunday afternoon, I had a phone call from some guy who bought one in, in um, Copenhagen. And he said, the grease is on my floor. <laughs> and I, I remember the guy, actually, I remember saying to him, look, this is software, the, the analogy is software hardware, so, and the software is going to move around. And, and the, second, the, second, uh, the second part of it is, I'm interested in making, a, I'm make, in making an artwork that start, that continues to make itself after it leaves my artist's hand, this precious hand of the artist. Um, and then there was a third level that uh, I, I brought on. I, I found Greece interested for, for those reasons I've given, but a third reason was the, the idea of being British was getting very greasy. The, there was hell to play in Belfast at the, at the time I was making these. And they, that had been going on for 500 years, that one. The SMP was surfacing, and the Welsh were burning second homes bought by the English. So I then started making grease works in the form of a Union Jack, which is what I wanted to show here. But they didn't have the space for it. So and that that one was a ref the, the the grease there was 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 politically loaded in the sense of of um, Nicholas Sturgeon and Jerry Adams. It was more of that idea of it being a grunt and therefore like not something that you could say kind of uh, was involved with you know questioning the politics of the time or like that you could make sense of. Um, not illustrating anything or symbolising anything. Just well, it's the gruntiness of it. But I think like the fact that it spills onto the floor is kind of funny. So that for me is yeah. Grunty. Well, the grunt is um, you know it's it's it's, it's not the easiest m medium to control. For example, Joseph Boyce did one. In it was it was called Fat. It's a lump of, I think the Tate have it, don't they? It's a lump of fat, but they, they froze it. So the artist controlled it. And, and we won't get onto Joseph Boyce, he's, he's certainly one of my favourite um, <laughs> operations. <laughs> um, but um, 
The, so the grunt comes from the fact that the grease is what it is. And, for example, I think Jonathan had mentioned this somewhere. Um, Rennie Gamble was here tonight. Sold, provisionally sold a couple of works. I forget his name. Was it Gessel, his name? Yeah. And he took them to Israel or somewhere, didn't he? In a, in a truck. Across the Negev Desert or whatever desert it was. I mean, it must have been 140 degrees in the back of this truck. So, so the grunt was that it turned to liquid. And he sent them back. He didn't buy them, did he? He said, he said it wasn't the work he bought or, <laughs> or, or whatever. So it had quite, it had quite political repercussions in terms of the relationship between artist and collector and artist and dealer. Yeah, I'm, quite, I'm still quite interested in Greece in, in that sense. And it that, seems that very non language. Just, <laughs> sorry? It seems like the antithesis of language. Oh, I could I talk think. forever on Greece. Just to interpolate here, uh, a homage to Ben and Jonathan who did actually remake these yeah, two yeah. Greece sculptures and uh, have quite a story about uh, getting control, minimal control of the Greece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, well, we're on the Greece works, but the Greece works are, I, I, I it was the it was the technician at Leeds that made the first grease works, and um, it, it it was quite interesting that um, this is a guy who, firstly, he's low status. He's not he's not a full skill lecturer like I am. He's technician. There's all that running through the, the, the social positioning of being an artist. Um, secondly, he's probably relatively skillful, but he's not as skillful as my father-in-law, who was a time Sir Carpenter, and who made, who made furniture in whenever it was, the 1940s, that will last till the 2540. But Nevertheless, he's the guy who put the things together, and I paid him for it. But um, it doesn't alter the fact that somehow Greece brought out that kind of proletarian set of relationships, because he couldn't control Greece either. He could control the troughs and the wood, but the Greece was beyond, it was beyond craft, in a sense. And I came to it, basically I came to it because I'd, it, was, it was the first time I'd got interested in, in Alan Turing. I was reading Alan Turing in computers and software, hardware, the analogy was going, going through my head. So I began to look and it came to me when I saw the Joseph Boy's fat thing. But, uh, he is an artist who's using an uncontrollable medium and wants to control it. Now, why does he want to control it? Because art, that's what artists do, they control their medium. You know, if you're a painter, you wait for it to dry. And it, it, it had a lot of interesting feeds. There's, um, there's a thing here, a quote, I have to put my glasses on. This is from an art historian, T.J. Clark, <laughs> and I haven't, um, I haven't got my glasses. I think they're at the back with Sue. I'll try and read it without my glasses. Get, get the old I'll read it. Oh, this one, Neil. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. Or is paint itself suggesting divergences from the model, which the painter can't resist going along with? This is a sort of test case of how and how far the medium or the feedback from the medium to eye to hand is bound to enter into the business of making likenesses. Yeah. Feedback. Where are we? Yeah. 
feedback. So Greece is the it's perpetual feedback. It's Pollock. It's a Pollock painting that never dries out yeah. because uh, it can. Uh, it, Providing it's left alone like it is now, and there's no environmental interference with it, it'll probably be reasonably stable. But if some, if some guy who's, I don't know, going to put it in a show comes along and he's had a very bad night the night before or he's pissed off with somebody and he, he handles it roughly, it'll fall out for sure. If the temperature goes up, it, it becomes something else. So that idea of feedback was strong with, with, with Greece that, that, that feedback you cannot control but paradoxically if you look at Pollock it, it's because it can be controlled that Pollock is what Pollock is. It, it, he certainly had feedback from a, li a liquid state operation but it, it, it all, be, all becomes solid state. It was that kind of interest in, in the, that's what I meant by the grunt. Yeah. I guess um, that makes the apparatus around it and the shape and the colour and, you know, there's a thousand questions I could ask about, you know, the connection between that and lettering and, but I'll <laughs> save them for after so you can yeah. answer them. Yeah, please. Yeah, I just wondered, as you were speaking, Terry, that is the relationship with, uh, like, something like uh, John's use of encaustic and wax. I mean, would the same thing happen with John's painting if the temperature changed? I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but it's a thought. I, I, but I, my guess is that, where are they? Those, those encaustic ones, they're in big American museums. Yeah. 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 They'll, 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 they'll have them. Yeah, they'll have, are they? Yeah. Well, they must be stable, I would think, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, they're pretty stable. Yeah. So it, I, I, I imagine that it's probably temperature resistant. Because wax is incredible, like grease mm. is incredibly temperature yeah. um, sensitive. I don't know, but the answer to that question is I don't know. Yeah. Can I ask you a, a follow-up question on feedback? Then just coming back to you know much smaller scale. I mean, I really hope that uh, people have a chance to look at some of these close up, some of the drawings. You know, because you have a particular way of drawing. Uh, you know, and uh, you look at that man's face that I'm was yeah. particularly focusing on. The the kind of breakup of lines, sort of making shadows, making an eye socket, making a mouth, making the expression. Right, the breakup of lines and the fact that uh, there's a certain kind of approximation going on there. You know, leaving out, mm. pushing certain things further. I, um, I mean, it's sort of a naive question, and yet it's the question, really. Um, it's a good one. Is, is you're sitting there, the TV's going, mm. it's a light operation, but you're concentrating. Yeah. You're, you're, you're involved with... And what's happening there? Are you trying for the best possible lightness of the photograph that you're working with, or is something else happening? Well, if I am, I'm not very good at it, put it that way. Um, yeah. But you mentioned it, that these are all from photographs. Yeah. Practically all of them are from photographs. Um, in fact, I think they all are. Maybe the tent one on the end. Maybe I conjured that one up for want of a better phrase myself. But uh, they're all from photographs, and I think from photographs... It's probably, that's probably a recursion back to some juvenilia that I, they used to tell you at the Slade that, uh, you know, when I, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, um, I, when I went to the Slade, they had about four life rooms. So you drew from the figure. Yeah. And uh, I remember seeing this uh, uh, Rauschenberg show at um, the American Embassy. And it had a lot of... Um, I mean, it, it, if you think of the early Cubism where there's a bit of text or a bit of a photograph, or maybe a collage, etc., but 
there's something big scale about this. And I remember thinking, here's Rauschenberg, when in 1961, let's say, and here's me, 1961, and they're telling me I should be drawing an anatomical drawings. Yeah. So I think all that background comes in. I've, I've always used photographs and, and never really been interested in the life drawings. And I, I was surprised yeah. to see works yeah. like like uh, Lucy and Freud and Jenny Savile come back into operation, come back into circulation. Yeah. In the early 60s, it would have been unheard. And, and, and during that period, when, when that I'm talking about, we would, with, with let's say fine arts, we were aspect blind to, to the fact that there were artists in the world like Lucy and Freud working, because they, would, they seemed to be drawing from the figure. Yeah. Um, but drawing from the figure from a photograph has always been almost au naturel. Yeah, yeah. But I'm so want to press you on that, just to say that, so you're selecting the photograph, obviously, because the photograph strikes you, it, you know, it, it, it has some kind of quality that you, you want to draw. Um, do you discover what that quality is well, you select when the, you're drawing it? You select or? the photograph and then you select from the photograph. Yeah. Um, I get that, that, that's putting it very simply. Yeah. But um, I'm never, I'm, I'm quite interested in why I would choose this photograph as opposed to that photograph. Yeah. So the particulars do work. But it, the reasons for that are probably, with this series, are probably quite com compact. That is, it's not a, a great range of, of um, choice. Uh, it, it, you limit it yourself. Uh, I want, it want, it's going to be basically about World War Two. It's so you don't go and look at photographs of Andy Warhol with yeah. with whoever. Uh, I mean. Those sorts of things are almost at a kind of semi-conscious level. Yeah. Um, the way you come to the photograph, and then you start choosing the photograph, and quite often it's not till you start. And we come back to feedback. It's not till you start drawing from the photograph that that you, having started drawing the photograph, the feedback from having started drawing the photograph then makes you. Re-examine the photograph, yeah. yeah, not just the drawing, and you then start picking things out maybe from the photograph. Yeah. On the other hand, they're really quite broad. The, these things, I did look at a, a lot of images of E.T. and a lot of images of Bart and so on, but um, <laughs> but you know, they, I knew that I would, those were the ones I was interested in. It, there was no competition. I wanted an image of Bart. Yeah. An image of E.T., an image of whoever, yeah. Stalin, or whoever. Yeah. Please. Can I just uh, press upon the, <clears throat> the context of E.T. within your images? Um, it was touched on earlier that maybe it's suggestive, suggestive of you in terms of representing you. Do you think... <clears throat> Is it something more about, is it you, or is it something about E.T. being other, being kind of alien, or is it something to do with um, the creator Spielberg and his Jewishness that's also kind of representing um, the imagery of E.T.? I would never thought about um, Spiel, Spielberg's Jewishness, um, that's for sure, but um, these are very influential images uh, on film. And I'm not saying these are very influential images, <laughs> the, the film images, are, and, and uh, you know they, they 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 pack a very powerful economic punch. They, they, I don't know what the what the take on ET ET film was. It must have been billions, I would think. Um, so yeah, th those are the sort. Of, it's certainly the fact that they're populist that interests me, and that they they have a very wide audience. As opposed to, let's say, Goya's Capricorn. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I'd, 
I, I didn't do any research on it, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Goya's Capricos is just as widely distributed as Spielberg's E.T., but I doubt it. And the fact that I doubt it is one of the reasons I went to E.T., because it is populist. And I thought, shoving, uh, shoving an image that is, that is about the, the future, with E.T. particularly, um, I thought that would be an, uh, perhaps a useful juxtaposition. But there's a lot of betting and trying going on. I mean, I'm, I don't mean by that there's a lot of sketches for these. There's hardly any sketches for them. They were just done, got out of the way. But um, there's a lot of betting and trying in thinking which photograph, uh, what photograph, what, what subject, that, those sorts of, uh, and those are all cognitive operations, I suppose. Well, I'm just thinking... Not knowing what you just said, but I was interested in why the Greece works are juxtaposed with these recent drawings. But it strikes me that these are greased as well, aren't they? Because they're not really historical realism, although they are part of that. But when they've got ET turning up, it's a sort of it's a disruption, isn't it? And you, what you were saying about the Brechtian sort of, you can't. I mean, I think some if somebody investigated these drawings and the things in them, you'd learn a lot about the subject matter. But then somebody might go, well, that didn't happen, did it? You know, that mm. picture didn't. So I thought that was quite a... I couldn't understand the link between the two works, if there is a clear link between putting them together. There isn't. But there sort of is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they... And I thought the group... I mean, I've been interested in how they seem a sort of realism to me with an interruption, because that's like some sort of... I don't know, Swedish bathroom or something. I've always thought it must have been gone down to some shop and bought this ready-made panel, I don't know. Anyway, it's just a, there's this kind of slippage going on here, isn't there? Quite a lot. And Tim's talking about why did you pick that photo? And is it the most, you know, is it the best photo? But maybe sometimes it's the reference to the person more than the, that particular photo. And then you do what you do with it. Swedish bath the Swedish bathrooms are interesting. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Your next series, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of a, a kind of Swedish <laughs> sauna with one of these in. Steamworks. Yeah. The characters refer to scenes that are going on outside of the drawing. Yeah. As I remember, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Frightened by something that's happening outside the drawing. Well, that, that, that's one thing we, I should have mentioned, we haven't mentioned, that's the titles. This is what I was going to ask. Yeah. Actually, the, the fact that the pictures seem to lead so far off will be explained by or extrapolated by the titles. Yeah. And the titles themselves remind me of some of J.G. Ballard's more fantastical kind of countercultural pop, pop art kind of writing. Um, which then makes me think as well the way we were talking about unruly uh, materials and surely you're dealing with the most unruly of materials which is time no? I mean you're cutting these things through from, from various different places and trying to keep them together in one impossible thing I guess the question would be yeah how do the titles how how, how, how does it um, how the titles come to you from which comes first so. well I, I, I do think the titles if there is any bite in these drawings, they don't bite without the titles. Put it that way. Um, but the the the, the um, Tim had already Tim had already mentioned it early on. I mean, we're into the language relationship, and it, you know, <clears throat> the first time I can remember the term visual language coming up was. Because I don't know what it is, a visual language. And I've been, I've been puzzling over it since 1958. Um, was the painting tutor at Barnsley. He used this term, he was talking about a, a Flemish painter called Constant Pemica, who did big slab-like, I mean... That's the, that's the very term he used to use when he used to look at them. And he, he told me, this guy, Permaker, got a visual language. I mean, I've got nothing against Permaker. He seems an okay painter, you know. But I couldn't understand what 
what it was that he was talking about. And, and it seems to me quite an interesting question. That's this thing that Tim just read out, that business of feedback. What does happen when you look at something, let's say, and let's just take feedback. Something comes back to you. It goes to the eye. And what I think, Tim, what I would do with, with Tim's thing is between the eye and the hand, I'd say the brain was in there. Now, what is that? What happens when we look at a picture? Is there a difference between... The, you, you hear, I, I've heard many art theorists, art historians, talking about reading a painting, for example. What, what's going on with that? Uh, if you take a tour of the National Gallery, with a, with a guide. The guide doesn't operate retinally. It's not retina to retina. The guide's telling you, you know, you can hear the well-rehearsed procedures of, of linguistic meaning. What is, and, and this is, I think, what one of the things we, we've, we've kind of argued about over, you know, over kind of emails. <laughs> <laughs> for the want of a better phrase. Yeah, one way of summing it up is when I hear you say, if these drawings have any bite, <laughs> they, uh, I think you almost said, they have it because of the title. I really don't think, well, it doesn't correspond to my, yeah, we... uh, my experience of them. They have plenty of bite. They, they're, you know, they're, they're conveying... Uh, a view of propositions about the world, um, mm. and then I look at the title, and the title feeds mm. in to, mm. to to that bite, to that complexity. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a a word. Obviously, I'm going to regret saying in it bite. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it coming. Yeah. Um, Quick question. Sir. How do you know what the works are without reading the titles? I mean, the, oh, just a quick example. Oh, there's yeah. a work by an older work by Terry, not here. I'm going to tap this thing up. And um, it's, I think it's called um, Soldier with a Jam Tart Squashed on His Face. Yeah, it is, yeah. So it completely throws you when you. Mm. But it's a, a, di a disease, isn't it? He's got a kind of. He's been injured or. Well, at the yeah. time. The, 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 so how do you. <laughs> You read something when you see it, obviously. Well, I, I think, I, you know, I think we find... I find my way around the world a lot of the time not knowing what, you know, what where I am, what it is I'm confronting, what it is I'm experiencing, who the hell I am anyway. You know, I mean, I think those various states of not knowing... Uh, actually, the, the, see, here would be the... <laughs> We better not get started on this, <laughs> you know. But I mean, it seems to me. Look, we, Terry and I, completely agree with the whole Chomsky proposition that right, this amazing virtual reality machine mm. called language, mm. uh, which probably happened, you know, rather rapidly as uh, some kind of brain mutation. Uh, or set of mutation, but rapidly, rapidly. And, you know, once it's found, wow, it was off and running, you know. I mean, we, we never look back, and actually, well, sadly. Um, but, I, you know, all I would say is that at the same time as language was accelerating and just, you know, becoming the human, uh, there was Lasco. There was Altamira, there was Chauvet, you know, there was depiction. There were these other, these other practices. I, they weren't languages, it wasn't visual language, but they were practices of confronting experience, confronting the world, confronting place, space, feeling, the feeling of what happens. There's, uh, there's a thing by Ian Tattersall, who was a paleontologist, the, big, the, the biggest American paleontological museum in New York. He's a Brit, um, and with a name like Tattersall, he would be, he's probably from Lancashire, I think. Um, 
he he says the sixty-four thousand dollar question that has been posed is: Did Neanderthals talk? Now, the the record, the paleontol the paleontological record is sca is scarce anyway, scanty. Um, brain soft tissue it doesn't preserve. Skulls do. The bit we know is from the fact that the hard stuff. The recesses that the, they they can make guesses from from that kind of thing, but he says that before our ancestors, the hominid ancestors, the Homo sapiens moved out of East Africa, they probably had got language because they they were called the Cro-Magnons. They destroyed the Neanderthals in what ten generations, and. One thing we certainly know, and this, the, these drawings are an attempt to testify to it, is that the one thing Homo sapiens can't, do, can't stand is competition. So they'll destroy each other. And we're back to Mark Mazar. That, that's where I th I'm interested in the notion of language. It's certainly the thing that characterizes, but it's certainly the thing if you now look at climate change, we could actually, all, all, all that, the, in, the entire industrial revolution is made by language, by the acquisition of language. And when did the talking start? Well, were they talking or not? The Neanderthals apparently didn't speak. Yeah. They didn't have language. They may have had, where's our friend? They may have had grunts. <laughs> they, may have, they may have had animal communication. We certainly know animals can communicate. But the argument about language is whether language was language started because we weren't needed to communicate. That's a very common thesis. It's anti-Chomsky. But the Chomsky argument is that language makes an internal world. It's an internal instrument. And we don't know anything about it. We know very little about it. We know much more about it the last 60 years than, than we, we, we did in the previous thousands of years. Mm. And the, I won't go on. We could, we'd be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> this is the interesting bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to, to um, Listen to 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 um, Evans up in University of Bangor. You know the, the, these guys who are challenging Chomsky who claim that universal grammar is dead. Your your guy, you, you ordered the book. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that Chomsky's wrong. He'd certainly be the first to admit the possibility that he's wrong, but. These guys are saying the science is out. It's out there now, and Chomsky's wrong. I'm not convinced it is. I, I tend to think language has, has got very little to do with communication. That that's become an accidental byproduct. I think what we were, what we started with, was something where we could talk to ourselves, so to speak. It's a metaphor at best, because. It, so my model of language is Chomsky in that sense. But, uh, for, for example, we can speak the sounds we make because our larynx are at a certain level. And it's not like an orang orangutans. Um, arrangement here. That, that's the evolution bit tied to the kind of biology bit. And even Darwin, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, as I've said to Tim, I'm a signed up Darwinian, but I'm definitely against an overdetermined Darwin. If, if it's all happening very slow, gradual steps, which is the origin of species, thesis, 
By the time you get to the descent of man, which is what, 12 years later, 1871, he's already saying, language doesn't fit it. It appears suddenly, out of nowhere, this species comes that can carve up the world. And this is what happens. This is great, and thank you so much for um, coming here. One of the things that um, has been striking me that we haven't quite been talking about um, is the part of your work that is kind of unseen by the viewer, and that is your arrangement of the figures within this consistent um, unit of the paper. It's always a landscape format, and it, well, it's not always, but it's mostly yeah. a landscape mm -hmm. format. And the more the talk went on, the more I became struck, particularly by the ET, which is just right above your head, just diagonally above with the soldiers retreating. Oh, well, this one, yeah. Yeah. And um, I, be I began to uh, ruminate on the fact that this is a, a compositional format that you use frequently. Um, that is that there's a frontal figure and then there's something else going on behind and indeed the one right beneath that has a similar format. Mm. And um, I know that you can't be sitting next to Tim without understanding that E.T. and the one that I first mentioned is it, it reiterates the format of the bar at the Folie Berger. <laughs> <laughs> almost to almost yeah, yeah. right? It's right it's there. Hi. But it also happens again and again that there's a kind of very, uh, a very sort of interrogative or, mm -hmm. you know, frontal picture playing thing going on. Yeah, yeah. I wondered if you might, I'm sure that this, I mean, the one, that one with the little kind of Dickensian figures um, is doing it again. So is there anything in there that you would like to talk about? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably quite a lot. I think we'll be here a long time, though. Um, I, actually, I hadn't thought of the Folie Berger, but now you point it out, it's blindingly obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't, I, and I didn't make a, a conscious decision between what should be landscape and what should be vertical. Um, it generally was the photograph that, that kind of, but you're right, yeah. You do a head count on these and yeah, the vast majority are, are horizontal. And that, that, I guess, I'd leave to somebody else to sort out. The same in the National Gallery, though, isn't it? Sorry? It would be the same in the National Gallery, probably. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a, a universal trait amongst artists oh, yes. that they, they plump for... Is that, is that what you're hinting at or yeah. saying? Hmm. But that's really too simple, isn't it? Because the bar of the is Yeah, there's a horizontal versus a vertical arrangement, but that doesn't get us very far. We see the world mostly horizontally, don't we? I don't know. <laughs> you, you've got me thinking about how I see the world now. Do I see it vertically or horizontally? Does it come? Does it come out like that? I don't know. You often do well, seem. Eyes next to each other, not one above you often seem to see it in layers, as Anne was suggesting. I mean, I was sort of looking at the the planes in front of the uh, Reichstag, the Reichstag, mm -hmm. and, and the one next door. Is yeah. quite, three layers, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember old, uh, you know, the disgraceful Paul de Man, you know, saying, "Well, you know what? what uh, pictures are weird yeah. because they depend on foreground and background." And this is a complete 
Yeah. You know, this is just an arbitrary binary. It doesn't yeah. really correspond to the experience of the yeah. world at all. Yeah. Well, that's demand. Yeah. 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 Well, perhaps these don't... Yeah. Anne's got me thinking on that one. <laughs> Question back there. Um, you said earlier that... Um, mm -hmm. So why can't I be observed when you're describing uh, your process? And like, I think you kind of like dance around it a bit. You mentioned your grandkids, and I think in a lot of these images, there's a feeling. Or I sense you looking at the image, or you going through the book and seeing um, these historical scenes. Would you say that these are autobiographical kind of images? Well, I guess they are in so far as. I remember World War Two, or, or, if, if that's what you mean by, or do they refer to my experiences? Not necessarily of the war itself, but your experiences of um, perceiving them in like, the media. I just feel like you're the centre point that they kind of revolve around. Yeah, well, you might be right. You could be right. I'm approaching a point of exhaustion. Yes, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you've. Uh, can, can we have one last question? Is, is that is that fair? <laughs> well, it's not fair, no, but <laughs> <laughs> it's reality. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I wonder how much important it is that they're all seen together for you. You asked if they were, yeah, that's if they were hung in yeah. order, and yeah. whether if one is seen on its own, then it loses its bite or. I don't know. I don't know if it does, because this is the first time they've, they've been shown anyway. Um, but it, it certainly was my, my demand, for the want of a better phrase, that they, we show the lot. I'd have preferred to show all the American Civil War ones as well, for example, but yeah. there just wasn't room. It's, it's the same with the, the big flag on the floor that I wanted. Um, it is probably important that they, for for a while anyway, they seem together. I mean, the one answer to that might be a book, but then the difference between seeing the Capricos and having a book of the Capricos like I've got, it, it's quite a big difference. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, having them here on the wall, it's a, it, it's great because there's sort of you. Are, it confronts you with the idea, you know, the question, well, is this a developing train of thought mm. or is this a syntax or, uh, you know, do I necessarily extract out of this grid, you know, and focus attention arbitrarily and so on, you know, mm. all those, que which are questions about language, actually. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I think the limit on these, like the limit on almost anything you do, is fatigue, in one sense. There's a kind of weariness sets in at a certain point. It was about drawing 60, I would think, that it, become, it becomes fairly acute, and you think, yeah, I ought to get them out somewhere, yeah. not just do them. Um, those sorts of questions arise. Yeah. But they are idi idiosyncrasies that, that get into the system that I'm sure, well, I, I think most artists, but certainly I'm not aware of, that have probably influenced some of the things that have been brought up tonight that I'm simply just not aware of. The Folie Bégère thing, for example, it now looks, as I said, blindingly obvious. <laughs> I just needed... I just needed the bass bottle, <laughs> just here, with that, with that triangle on it. <laughs> so I, I guess that, that's, how, that's how it is. I mean, I'm, I'm t tending to resort to being glib, I think, and that's not a good sign at this stage in the evening. Terry, can I just, one quick, very yeah, answer, yeah. almost a yes or a no, really. Do you envisage it working any of these up larger? No, like, no. Like, oh, oh, sorry, that's quick. Mm. But I, was, I was thinking <laughs> of the postcard, the, the trans-historical postcard stuff you had yeah. on show at the Whitechapel. Yeah. And there's a no. Yeah. Well, I haven't got, in fairness, Jane, I haven't got um, 
I haven't got a studio. So I'm probably going to have to, if I'm going to do a big, and I'm thinking about it, it I, I'll, I'll need a bigger, more wall space to do bigger works. Um, and if I do bigger works, they'll probably be painted. There are actually two paintings that were made in the American Civil War, in the American Civil War series, but uh, they're abroad. I would have liked to have shown them, for example. Um, but these ones were, they're called studies, and that's, that's how I saw them, yeah. Great. Well done to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. um, just a reminder that uh, the book I have supplied um, publications of Tim's, um, and also you can pre-order a publication that we've produced um, as Josie, which is based on the exchange between Terry and uh, Tim. And finally, thank you so much uh, for joining us, and thank you too for joining us too. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.